We join each of us together in a different stage of our journey of faith. We don't exist to make our own name great, but to make God's name great. We exist to show Jesus to those who've been outcast, those who've been forgotten, and those who've walked away from God. We exist for those who have a past and have moved away from God. We exist to never make church complex, but to make it simple. We gather every week, not as individuals, but as a family, pushing and striving towards the same thing, knowing that Jesus was not for the select few, but he was for everyone. We believe that Jesus was the Son of God who lived a sinless life and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We believe that Jesus is the hope of the world, a light shining in the darkness. We believe that we choose today who we will be today will determine what the world and community will be like tomorrow. We have a mission to be called to discipleship and community, to bring our best in excellence and worship, to be hospitable to all and always have our doors open to whoever who would come through them, to be a people of generosity for the world, to the hurting, to the lost and the broken, where as a family we can work together to bring light to the darkest corners of the earth. Our vision is to be the church that God calls us to be, to be a church for Lapine and for the community and the world around us. High Lakes is not just a building, it's a movement of people who are making the bold claim, this is for everyone. Well, good morning, church family. My name is Isaac, I'm the student pastor here at High Lakes, and I wanna welcome those who are online today as well. How's that for a rainy, wet week? Uh, yeah, some of us love the rain. Some of us wish that we were still snowbirding. Uh, but man, we need this stuff for our reservoirs and everything else. We're excited to announce again that next week, starting on the 30th, we'll be uh, reopening our nursery. And so Rachel, who's right now in the back working on a crib, getting that going, uh, she's back there. If anybody would like to volunteer for that, we'd welcome your help. And uh, that'll be, we need a couple more volunteers. So that's starting next week, May 30th. We love our younger families, and this is one of the ways uh, that we support them. And so if you've got any gifting passion in that area, we'd welcome your help volunteering uh, there in the nursery. We are a, a healthy church, and one of the signs of that, as you can see on our drums here, we got Izzy playing today. Awesome job, Izzy. Uh, with both the young and the slightly older, I won't point out anybody here, but uh, with the... Uh, Young and old, that's an awesome, healthy church. And with a healthy church, oftentimes is a growing church. And so we've got a need uh, with our sound team right now, uh, back on the soundboard. If you've got giftings, passions for the soundboard, being able to help in that area, we need the help, especially as we move into a new building with an awesome new sound system. It's going to be important to have a, a team there. So uh, if you're able to help with that, would you come find Aaron right after service and just let him know for that? June 6th is going to be an exciting Sunday for our young people as we celebrate the various promotions from seniors into college, from uh, eighth graders into our high school program with fifth graders going into sixth grade. So we'll celebrate uh, those students moving up uh, June 6th. So be sure to be here, bring the kids if you got them uh, for that Sunday. Hey, as much as this was an exciting week, it was also a really, really tough week for us as a church. Uh, we tragically lost a dearly beloved brother, uh, CJ, this week. He passed away. So we're going to be celebrating uh, his life. We're going to have a memorial service this Friday at 6 p.m. here at the church. So we'd love to have you guys be here for that. Uh, an incredible man of God with an incredible testimony. And uh, we're confident that God is going to do even more in the wake of uh, his death uh, than he would have with his life. We believe God's going to use this tremendously. So please be here uh, Friday at 6 p.m. if you can uh, for his memorial service for CJ. If you're a guest with us today, uh, you'll notice there's a heck of a lot of construction, renovation going on. We're excited about what God's doing here at High Lakes. Uh, so the main bathrooms are still under construction, but just through these two doors uh, are another set there. Thank you, Marlene. <laughs> And uh, we'd encourage you in the bulletins, we have a connection card. Go ahead and fill that out. We'd love to be able to connect with you. It's one of the ways that we as shepherds uh, know who's here and who's been missing for a while. It's a way for us to check up and be able to connect with you. So let's take a couple of moments now, stand up, greet one another, and uh, we'll get moving into worship.
the sorrow comes to steal the joy of me. When brokenness and pain is all I know, no, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. same power that raised Christ to life is alive in us today. It's alive in us today. We have that power inside of us, the resurrection, the chance of new life, forgiveness, hope, and, and love because of what Christ did on the cross. Because he paid it all once and for all, we have forgiveness. Because he paid it all, we have the chance to live life new. And guess what today? There's going to be a baptism day. You're going to see this idea of dying to the old and being raised to the new. Right, Denver? Isn't that right? Amen to that. We're going to sing right now about the fact that Jesus paid it all for us. church.
Lord, you did wash us. You make us white as snow. God, you do amazing and incredible things in our life because you are able. You are the way maker. You have the ability to bring hope in the midst of suffering. In hard times, God, you are with us, Lord. Sometimes I look at the world and I don't know how they're able to get through the things they do without you, Lord. You're the only one that can give us peace when when hard times come. You're the only one that can bring uh, hope when we have no hope, God. And I pray that we, as we continue to sing today, God, that we would be renewed by the hope that you give to us, that you are able, you are the way maker, God. We thank you for that. It's your name we pray, amen.
Thank you so much for being with us today. Lord, we believe in you. We believe that you are able. We believe that you are God. And because you are Lord, that we can receive forgiveness in our life. God, we thank you for that. It's in your name that we do pray. Amen. Feel free to grab that communion cup as you have a seat there. We move into a time of communion. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here today. What great worship songs, huh? Boy, if those words don't stir your heart, nothing will. That was very good. Thank you, worship team. What a great job. As Aaron mentioned, if you haven't picked up your communion cup, they're in the kitchen there in the window. That would be a good time for that. Um, as we enter into our worship of Jesus with communion, we think of how he came to us all those years ago and died a brutal death so that when we believe in him, give our hearts to him and follow him, we can have our sins forgiven and eternal life with him. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 25, 1 through 7 tells us how our faith in God will never be put to shame and that God will guide us, show us mercy forgiveness and goodness. The benefits of following Jesus are numerous indeed. I'd like to read that scripture, uh, Psalms 25, 1 through 7. It reads, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you are good, O Lord. Let's take a moment and reflect on what Jesus did for us on the cross and thank him for his mercy, forgiveness, and goodness. Let's just take a moment. First Corinthians 11:19 tells us when Christ was in the upper room with his apostles he gave the command to remember him in this way 
He took the bread, broke it, and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Then he took the cup, saying, This is the covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Let's take the cup together. Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings that you give to each and every one of us. We just thank you, especially for dying on that cross for us and enabling us to have a way to eternal life with you, Lord. We just pray that you'd be with each and every one in the remainder of the service. Be with Pastor Ben as he gives the message. And we just give you thanks. You're our God, and we love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Our young kids want to head for Kids Church. Most of them have. If there are any stragglers, now's a good time. If you're uh, age five, or actually age four through grade five, um, we got a great children's service. Next Sunday, I believe it's next Sunday, I think Isaac already said we're going to be reopening the nursery, which will be fantastic, especially for those younger families that haven't been able to come in, in quite some time. And so um, really excited to, to be able to offer that again and... and um, just kind of continue to move on with life. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah, kind of excited about that. So Revelation chapter 2 is where we are today. If you'll take your Bibles and uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2. And we begin in verse 18 is where we're going to be looking today. So if you have a Bible, uh, grab it. Um, if you don't have one, there's probably one in one of the chairs in front of you. Be sure and uh, grab one of those and uh, follow along as we, as we talk about the book of Revelation today. Now, um, first of all, I think it's important to understand where this place of Thyatira, which is the next letter that um, Jesus writes to, Thyatira, and it's in modern-day Turkey. And we started with the book of Ephesus, and we went to Smyrna, and we went to Pergamum, and now we're at Thyatira. If you notice on the map behind me, you'll notice that these are going in perfect logical clockwise direction around the province of ancient Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. And so that's where we are, and that's where Jesus is writing um, to the churches through his apostle John from the island of Patmos where he was exiled for the sake of the gospel. That's where we find ourselves today. <clears throat> so there was, a, um, there was a hunter who raised his rifle, cocked the hammer, and took aim at a large grizzly bear. Just as he was about to pull the trigger, the large grizzly bear turned and saw the hunter with the rifle cocked, pointed at him, and the grizzly bear spoke in a soft and kind voice. Isn't it better to talk than to shoot, the grizzly bear said. Now, of course, this startled the hunter, and, and uh, the hunter was surprised. And so he looked at the grizzly bear, and the grizzly bear said this. He said, what is it that you want? Let's sit down and negotiate together, the grizzly bear said. The hunter said, lowered his rifle, and he said, I would like a fur coat. The grizzly bear said, well, that's a very reasonable, reasonable request. Why don't we just sit down, he said, because you want something, and I want something. You want a fur coat, and I want a full stomach. Let's sit and negotiate together. So the hunter and the grizzly bear sat down for a moment. Several minutes later, the grizzly bear walked away alone. The negotiations had been successful. The grizzly bear had received his full stomach and the hunter his fur coat. <laughs> Compromise. 
Compromise with the culture is like compromising with a grizzly bear. It will eat you alive. You've heard the proverbial story about the frog who was placed in the water, and he was swimming around doing the backstroke and having a wonderful time, and slowly the temperature of the water was turned up and up and up until the water got too hot was the frog's demise. Compromise with the culture will eat you alive. And Thyatira was a church where this was happening on an enormous scale. And I think the message from Jesus for the church at Thyatira is also a message for the church in the 21st century, particularly in America. Because, you know, we talked last week about Pergamon. Now, Pergamon was a church that was dealing with compromise with the culture. But specifically, the church at Thyatira, I think, is dealing with the very same compromise that faces the church in America day in and day out. We'll get to that in just a moment. The demands of our society when we cave to them are eating us alive. They're consuming us. They're watering down our distinctives. So we no longer stand out. We no longer shine as the church was called to shine in the culture around us because we're beginning to look just like them. Prompts Jesus to speak a word of correction to his church, a very sharp word of rebuke to the church at Thyatira. But before he does that, he first begins with a compliment. Now, this is the way all of the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation begin. They begin with a compliment. I love how gracious Jesus is. He doesn't just see the negative, because how many of you are like me, and if he was looking for the negative, it wouldn't be hard to find? Yeah. But he looks also for the positive, and so he begins with a word of encouragement to the church at Thyatira, and he begins with this compliment, and he says, I know your works. Read with me, verse 18, to the angel of the church at Thyatira, write, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. We'll get to that in just a minute. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are doing more now than you did at first. So there's this compliment. You're doing more than you did at first. Now, if you flip back just a, a page or so to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, verse 1, you'll notice a, a contrast here. The church at Ephesus was trending down. They started well, but they weren't finishing well. They weren't continuing to grow. The church at Thyatira started well and was continuing to grow, right? They were on an upward trend. They're doing more than they did at first. How many of you have noticed that it's easy? Let's think about marriage for a moment. Okay, marriage relationship. It's easy to lose the passion when you stop doing the things you used to do. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Same is true in our relationship with the Lord. And this is what's happening at the church at Ephesus was they stopped doing the things they were doing before rather than continuing to do them. Notice what they were doing. It was, uh, it was their love. It was their faith. And that love and faith produces something. It produces service and perseverance, which produces more love and faith because when you invest in where your heart is, right, you invest in where your heart is, your love for what you're investing in continues to grow. And so it became this cycle where the church at Thyatira was trending up in their love for God and their service for him. And I think the application is pretty clear for each of us that as a church, we need to keep doing the things that foster spiritual growth. And that's what they had done. They, were, they, they didn't jettison those things. They continued to be faithful in those. Thyatira is a church where that was happening at the end of the first century. But that's not the only thing that was happening. And so it prompts a word of correction from Jesus. You'll notice as we continue on in verse 20. Now before we get to verse 20, there's a few things you probably should know about Thyatira. It was a real place. It was a small town about the size of Redmond, 25,000, 30,000 people. And there was a context in its day. Even though it's one of the smallest cities in the ancient world, it was also the longest message that Jesus gave to his church. The longest message to the smallest church. And I wish that were a good thing, but it's not necessarily a good thing. He's got a lot of bad things to say to the church at Thyatira. Thyatira was uh, known as an industrial community. It was an industrial community. When I say the word Pittsburgh, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you? Some of you said steel, and some of you said stealers. <laughs> it, it works, right? That's what Pittsburgh is known for. It's known for the steel work, right? 
If I say the word Detroit, what do you think of? Cars, yeah. Think of cars because that's what's produced there. Well, when people said Thyatira in the ancient world, they thought of industry. And there were lots of industries in the city of Thyatira. In fact, the most of any ancient city that we know of. It was famous for its wool, its dyed linen, its leather, its pottery, its bakeries, and most of all, for its metalworking. Thyatira was famous for its metalworking, specifically a very, uh, a very specific kind of metal called burnished bronze. Notice the self-description of Jesus in verse 18. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like what? Burnished bronze. This is the place where that burnished bronze was produced. In an ancient world where they didn't have glass, they couldn't produce mirrors, they would polish bronze, this burnished bronze, purified, and they would be able to see their reflection in it. And that's what happens here with this burnished bronze. You'll remember, if you remember the story of the book of Acts, Paul planted a church in Philippi, which was not too far from Thyatira, and he there met a purple worker by the name of Lydia, and she was from the city of Thyatira, very industrious city. So Thyatira was this production city, and every artisan in Thyatira belonged to a trade guild. There were different trades, obviously, and these trade guilds functioned kind of like unions. They would protect the, the trade itself, the secrets of the trade, and they would, they, they would share those secrets. They had this camaraderie together in each one of these different trade guilds. These trade guilds overshadowed all of community life. Like a union today, it protected the workers. But the problem with these trade guilds, at least for the Christians, was if you weren't a part of the local trade guild, you were shunned. Recently, not too long ago, uh, a bunch of the nurses at St. Charles went on strike. And there were new nurses that had been hired to replace some of the old ones, and they would try to make their way to the front door when they were trying to get to work amidst a long picket line of people, both from the nursing crew, but also from the trade union, who were trying to shame them for not being part of their union. And you can imagine if you were a part of a trade guild in the, in the, in the early church here, and you, you, you chose, chose not to participate in that, there was shame that was involved, and you would be ostracized. Well, these trade guilds um, periodically had meetings that took place in a temple, a pagan temple, by the way, uh, of Apollos or Tyrimnos, which is two different words for the same god. He was the sun god, and he was the patron deity of the trade guilds. At these feasts, food was sacrificed to Tyrimnos, and a raucous party often ensued. Drinking, debauchery of every kind followed. Even uh, temple prostitution took place. Great sexual immorality took place there. Now, if you've, if you've ever worked for a, a company or an organization that had an annual Christmas party... You might be able to feel just a smidgen of what these Christians in Thyatira were feeling. How many of you have noticed that some of those Christmas parties, some of the company Christmas parties, there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful meal that's usually bought and paid for by the company, which is great. But how many of you have also noticed that sometimes the things that happen after the meal uh, are not so wholesome? Entertaining, yes. Wholesome, maybe not so much. In fact, usually by the time your coworkers get to their third or fourth drink, uh, things get pretty interesting. And it supplies the entire crew with this cadre of stories that will be told for the rest of the year about what so-and-so and somebody else did at the Christmas party. But not to worry, because they get repeated over and over again. And every year you get restocked with a new set of stories about what happened at the annual Christmas party. Same names, just, or different names, same types of problems. So maybe you're excited about going to the Christmas party, but not so excited about what might happen afterwards. So what do you do as a Christian? How do you graciously engage in something that mm, maybe you're not quite comfortable with, things that go on there? Do you shun it completely? Do you jump right in? These were the kind of questions that the church at Thyatira was wrestling with. We've got these trade guilds, and they have these Christmas parties. But to not show up would be seen as betrayal and disloyalty. I'll never forget, there was a, a, a guy that worked with me for an organization. And at one time, 
he was on his way out, at least was suspected that he was on his way out of the organization. But you know when I knew his heart was no longer in it? Yeah, when he didn't show up for the Christmas party. And, and what that said to us was, this person is no longer bought in. This person's heart is no longer here with us. And the problem with Christians rejecting the trade guild meetings was that the culture around them saw this as a betrayal. And that's what was taking place in the city of Thyatira. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the god that was worshipped at the trade guilds. Apollo Tyrimnos. Well, he was not only the sun god, but he was also considered the son of God. Notice, flip back to Revelation chapter 1, verse, oh, it would be right about verse 13. Among the golden lampstands, you will notice, verse 13, among the golden lampstands, was someone like the son of who? Not the son of God, the son of man. So it's interesting, Jesus takes his self-description here from chapter 1, and he changes one word out of it, because I think what Jesus is saying here is that it's not Apollo Tyrimnos, who is the Lord of your livelihood. It's Jesus who's the real Son of God. And you have to make a choice of which one you will serve. Where do your loyalties ultimately lie? Now, Tyrimnos not only was considered son of God, he was also considered the go-between between the god Zeus and humanity. On top of that, he had a prophetess who lived in Thyatira. Her name was Sambathe. She was, she was an oracle. And people would come to the oracle for a word from God. Should I pursue this next business venture? Should I go that way? What decision should I make for my future, and how will it turn out? It would be kind of like going to a psychic to get a reading. And Tyremnos was thought to communicate through this oracle and the shrine that she inhabited just outside the city. She was well-known in the community. So I want you to keep these cultural things in mind as we dive into verse 20, because the trade guilds, mandatory feasts, idolatrous worship of Tyremnos, the prophetess, who spoke on his behalf, Sambathe, the sexual immorality that took place there at these meetings. Now, take a look at verse 20. Jesus says this word of correction. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. This is not your mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> my mother-in-law's here. I have to be careful. I love you, Marcia. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. The historic Jezebel, you have to know something about Jezebel. Jezebel was a real woman in the history of Israel. She lived around 850 B.C., and she which was about a thousand years before this that we're studying today, this letter was written, right? 850 BC, she was the daughter of a Phoenician king, which is in modern day Syria, and she married into the royal family of Israel, and she was married to King Ahab, who was the king of Israel. He was one of the most wicked kings in all of Israelite history, but there was a reason. Ahab was extremely wicked in part because Jezebel, his wife, who was a foreigner, who married into the royal family, brought with her her gods from Syria. Specifically one god by the name of Baal. Maybe you've heard of him. Baal was the fertility god of the day. And Baal was the storm cloud god. He's pictured with a bolt of lightning in his hand. And Israel began to believe that it wasn't God, god Almighty who sent the rains. It was Baal who sent the rains and caused this agricultural society to thrive. She set up an altar next to the altar of God. When the Israelites would come to worship God, they would also go next door or right next to that, there was an altar to Baal, the storm god, the god of fertility, and they would sacrifice to God Almighty and then go right over here and sacrifice also to Baal because they thought to themselves, pretty good to have our bases covered, right? And God was displeased with how Israel had behaved. 
There was a lot of other stuff that went along with Baal worship. You can imagine as a fertility god, Baal would also require acts of prostitution and so forth that would take place in this worship of Baal that would take place there in Israel. And God was unhappy. But Jezebel was such a wicked person, she set up this altar next to the altar of God. In fact, she was so evil that eventually her attendants actually picked her up and threw her out of a third-story window. She splattered on the pavement below. Her blood splattered on the wall, and the chariots that were passing by ran her over. I'm not making this up. First Kings, you can read about it. First and Second Kings. And the chariots ran her over, and nobody bothered to bury her. And she laid there in the street the rest of the day. Somebody eventually finally decided, hey, you know what, um, she's a daughter of a king, we should probably at least give her a burial. So they went back to find her, and all they could find was her skull, her hands, and her feet, because the, the town dogs had consumed her. Yeah, the Bible's, Bible's just rated G, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, <laughs> This was all that was left. She was so wicked that God pronounced this judgment on her that the dogs would lick her up in the streets, and that's exactly what took place. She became a symbol of evil women whose idol worship was leading other people astray. Verse 20, remember I've been telling you throughout this series that the book of Revelation has a lot of symbols in it. And I believe Jezebel is a symbol not only for wickedness, but the kind of wickedness that causes adultery, causes worship of another God, unfaithfulness to God Almighty as we begin to allow the compromise with the bear of culture. So who is this Jezebel of Revelation chapter 2? There's a couple of options. I'll give them to you. First of all, she's, she, she might be a figurative name for a literal woman in the congregation at Thyatira. She may have been a a woman who rose to power, maybe she was an elder's wife, but she'd attained this position of influence and she was encouraging Christians at Thyatira to compromise with the idolatrous culture of the trade guilds that it was okay to sacrifice to another god. That's exactly what the historic Jezebel did in Israel, so it would make sense. Second option here is that she is not a woman um, and that gender is irrelevant, that she is symbolic for a, a, a false teaching or a group of false teachers who were teaching, just like I described, compromise with the trade guilds. The third option, I think, is the most likely, and that is that she is the oracle, the prophetess, Sambethe, that lived there in Thyatira. She claimed to speak on behalf of Apollo or Tyrimnos. And what we know of her lines up with the Jezebel description here in Revelation and the historic Jezebel, that she was an outsider. She introduced a foreign element into the church body. She was deeply involved in witchcraft. She was involved in the occult practices. And that would all qualify uh, the description of her teachings in verse 24. Notice what it says in verse 24 here. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. If you went to the oracle, you would ask the oracle a question. She would usually mumble. Her eyes would roll back in her head. She would go back into a trance-like state, and she would begin to mumble. And you had to listen carefully because she might only say it once, the answer to your question. She would seek wisdom on behalf of the god Tyrimnos, and then she would mumble the answer. And for a fee, you could get direction for your life. So what would happen if this oracle, this prophetess, became a follower of Jesus, but she clung to her oracle status? Or the people in the community still knew her as the oracle, so they were still going to her for this kind of occult-like spiritualism, this wisdom that she had? Well, whoever she was... The key issue is that the leaders in the church at Thyatira were permitting this influence of paganism to shape the result, the, the, the way that the church was thinking, to, to shape the values in the church. And they were giving a nod to what she was doing, this compromise. This getting in bed with the financial system of the culture. And Jesus has a stern word of warning. Notice verse 21. I've given her time to repent of her immorality. She's unwilling. Man, you know that's good news. 
I mean, the fact that she didn't repent is, is, is somewhat irrelevant at this point. What it tells me is that if there's hope for Jezebel, there's hope for me. There's hope for you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past looks like, the Lord is merciful, amen? And his desire is not to bring judgment. His desire is not to destroy. His desire is to offer mercy to people, even people like Jezebel, even people like me, even people with a past. Jesus says, I've given her time to repent. But there comes a point in time where he's given her time and he's given her time. And finally, with tears in his eyes, he pronounces the judgment of verse 22. When she was unwilling, I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. The consequences of spiritual adultery with the economic system around us, I'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute, but the consequences is that the church gets a spiritual STD, right? We get an STD from that, a spiritually transmitted disease from being in bed with the culture around us. And specifically, I know some of you are going, Ugh, do we have to talk about this? It's a great metaphor. It grosses you out. And guess what? That's what it looks like in the eyes of the Lord. And sometimes we don't see it. We don't see it that way. And sometimes we need to be a little bit disgusted to be able to look inside and say, wow, is this really who I have been? Jesus gives a word of correction, a word of judgment. Verse 23, I'll strike her children dead. Well, don't you think that's a little harsh? I'll strike her children dead? You have to realize that the, that, that the historic Jezebel, who was married to King Ahab, King Ahab had 70 sons, not all by Jezebel. Now, that would be impressive, right? <laughs> that would be an impressive feat, not all by Jezebel, but he had 70 sons, and God pronounced a word of judgment that not only would Jezebel and Ahab both perish in a horrible way, but he would put to death their children. There would not be one offspring left of their children. Guess what happened? Yeah, you guessed it. You don't have to guess. If God says it, it's going to happen. And the Lord said it, and the next king that came to power put to death every single one of Ahab and Jezebel's children, all 70 of them. And what the Lord is saying here is, if you're going to go after Jezebel, if you're, going to be, if you're going to commit prostitution with her, if you're going to have offspring by her, guess what? You're going to suffer the same fate. I don't like that. It's not warm and fuzzy, Lord. I want something that makes me feel good. Sometimes we have to hear hard things, don't we? So Jesus says, this is their fate. Notice verse 24. Enough bad news. He says, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, because not everybody had gone after her teaching. He said, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to those who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned this, this Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. I love that. I love that the Lord is not into giving us overburdensome commands. He's not into that. He's saying, I want you to exhibit holiness and faithfulness to me. And if you get that part right, a lot of the rest of it's going to fall into place. I love what the early church, the early church um, in Jerusalem, who was mostly made up of Jewish people, what they sent to the church at Antioch in Acts chapter 15. When the, when the church at Antioch, which was mostly a Gentile church, mostly non-Jewish, right? And they were asking the question, do we need to be circumcised in order for our family to be seen as, the, as part of the people of God? And the answer came back from the Jewish church, no, you don't. We want you to abstain from food offered to idols and from sexual immorality. These two things that the church is condemned for here because they had gone back to that. And what it was showing was that the church was compromising with the culture. The church was in bed with the culture around it, committing adultery, spiritual adultery with the, with the culture. And then the elders said this to the church in Antioch. They said, we will not impose any other burden on you. You think the word from Jesus right here is, I'm not going to impose any other burden on you. I want you to be holy, right? I want you to be set apart from me. And in this case, 
It was the economic system, the trade guilds, that Jesus was speaking against. He says, hold on to what you have. Hang in there. And I'll reward you in two ways. Notice verse 20, 26 and following. The one is victorious and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter, will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. And I'll also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Two things Jesus offers as a reward. First of all, he says, if you hold on to what you have, if you hang in there, I will give you authority. It's interesting, if you don't play by the rules of society, guess what? You're probably not going to advance real high. <laughs> How many of you have noticed that? We see this in politics all the time, right? We saw this just even a week, two weeks ago, I think it was. Uh, a congresswoman from, from Wyoming, I'm not making a political statement, but she, she dared to break with the party line, and guess what happened? You're out. They voted her off the island. <laughs> and that's the way the culture will treat you if you don't tow the party line, if you don't tow the narrative of the economic system of culture, right? You're going to be ousted. But Jesus says this, if you remain true, if you remain steadfast, even though you might not climb the corporate ladder, you, may not, you might not be winning in the eyes of the world economically and financially, what I'm giving you is more important because there is a life to come. And Jesus says, when I return, I'm going to rule the nations with authority. And guess what? The meek will inherit the earth, Matthew chapter 5. The, the poor in spirit to them belongs the kingdom of heaven. And what the Lord is saying is, you're going to rule with me. I will give you authority. And all those things that you forewent in this life because you wouldn't compromise your faith and you suffered for it, guess what? I'm going to make up for all of that. That's what he's saying. He goes on to say, I'll also give that person a second thing. I'll give them the morning star. The morning star. Well, what's the morning star? Well, think about it for a second. I mean, we have lots of stars in our solar system, but what's the closest one to Earth? What's the one we see in the morning? The sun, right? See, Tyrimnos was called the sun god, right? He was a sun god, and he was the son of God, son of Zeus, but he was also the sun god, and Jesus says, listen, it is I who is Lord of your livelihood. I don't care what the trade guilds have to say to you. It's not Tyrimnos that you owe your loyalty to. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the son of Zeus. It's the son of Almighty God. It's the son who rose with healing in his wings. It's the son that was predicted who would rise on the nation of Israel when Messiah came. That's the son that Jesus says, I'll give, I'll give myself to you. You'll reign with me. You'll be one with me. We will have authority in that next life when I come. And Jesus is saying, that's who I am. I'm the bright and morning star. I'm the true light that you need. And the compromise of the church at Thyatira of their distinctiveness for the sake of prosperity was the problem. So the application is simple for us. Here's the application. When we compromise our faith for the sake of our finances, it's spiritual adultery. It's spiritual adultery. That's what Jesus is saying to the church at Thyatira. And I think he would say the same to the church in America today. Remember Jesus' teachings about, about money as he said, you can't serve both God and money, right? You'll either love the one and hate the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. America, we are particularly susceptible to affluenza, spiritually transmitted disease of affluenza, that it's all about the bottom line. It's all about what we make. And Jesus says there's a lot more to it than that. See, I want to be clear. There's a lot of business opportunities that don't require us to compromise our faith. They don't. There's a lot of business opportunities out there like that. But there's a lot of business opportunities out there that do. They do ask you to make a compromise. Money is not our master. The church has to stop tolerating the Jezebelian idea that money is our master. That it's all on the altar for the sake of the bottom line. It prompts an uncomfortable question, and that is, who do we look for for our provision? Who do we look for? Do we, do we look to the world, or do we look to the God who supplies man in the desert? And maybe the question for us, as it was last week, is how does a Christian engage 
appropriately with the culture around us because we're not called to hunker in our bunker, amen? I mean, that's not who we are. We're called to engage the culture and engage with the culture, but how do we do that in such a way that doesn't compromise our values? I love what uh, Eugene Peterson says. He says, the answer is found in holiness. The answer is found in holiness. In but not of the world. Holiness is knowing and discerning the boundaries and never violating them. Let me put it to you this way. How many of you have, a, have more than one set of dishes and one of those sets of dishes is reserved for special occasions? Right? And you guard them with your life, correct? You want to wrestle? Get out of the room where my dishes are, right? Those dishes are holy. Not in the way you think they are. They're holy in the sense that that's what holy means. It means set apart for a special use. And that's who you are as a church. You are set apart for a special use. And that's what God is calling us to be. To have different values from the people around us. To be salt and light. That's, what, that's the whole metaphor. Jesus walks among the lampstands of the churches. We're to shine brightly in the culture around us. And we do that by being set apart, not by looking the same. And that's who he's calling us to be. Holy to the Lord. In fact, that's the very inscription. There was a, in the Old Testament, there was a high priest. He would go in and he would, he would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And he wore a turban around his head and had a gold plate on the front of it. And you know what the inscription was on that gold plate? Anybody remember? You know what it said? Mark's nodding his head. You know what it said? Holy, Holy to the Lord. That's what it said. And it went right here on his forehead. Now, if we were to translate that into a numerical value, we might translate it 777. See where I'm going with this? Holy, set apart to the Lord, faithful and loyal to him, no matter what the culture says, no matter what the bottom line says, no matter what your 401k says, no matter what your bank account looks like, I am holy to the Lord. Those who aren't holy to the Lord, they've, they've sold their soul to the economic system, right? And they have a different number on their forehead. What's that number? 666. Six, six. It's the mark of the beast. The beast of Babylon, right? The kingdoms of humanity, the kingdoms of the world. The way the world works is you follow our rules, you sell yourself to the culture around you, and we'll make sure you succeed. That's not the message of Jesus. Jesus says the way to ultimate eternal prosperity, the way to ultimate true life is in being holy and dedicated, not to the culture around us, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that made Israel separate from the culture around them was the Old Testament law. There were specific things they were called to do and not do. And one of those key commands was the command of Sabbath. The law of the Sabbath worship and rest meant that your schedule, specifically regarding your financial and economic priorities looked different from the culture around you. When the culture around you said, no, you're going to work seven days a week, the people of God said, no, we're not. We're going to take a day for rest to focus on the Lord. And it's the first day of the week, not the last day of the week, because who comes first? The Lord, doesn't he? Yeah. That's where our ultimate priority and our ultimate loyalty lies. And that's what made the people of God different. And I want to ask us today as a church, as a church... And I'm not just talking about us here in Lapine, but as a church universal, are we doing a good job of sticking to those distinctives or have we begun to wear cultural camo to where we just start to blend in? We just start to blend in. I don't know how, I don't know how this message is, is touching you today. And I don't know exactly what this looks like in your life because I don't know your situation. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit is saying to you right now, but I'm going to tell you what the Holy Spirit brought to my mind as I was preparing this message this week. And I don't like telling this story because it doesn't put me in a very good light. But since the very beginning of our marriage, my wife and I have, we've agreed on a value a value that in our home, the most important thing we can be about as a family is worshiping the Lord and passing our faith on to our children. Now, as you can well imagine, there's a lot of compromises 
a lot of, not compromises, a lot of sacrifices, that's the word I'm looking for, a lot of sacrifices that take place in order to do that and do it well. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that this is how it should look in every family, but I'm saying this is what we felt like the Lord laid on our heart, was that she wouldn't work, she would stay home. Let me just tell you this about my wife, she is extremely capable, she is highly employable, and two incomes are a lot more fun than one. <laughs> but we said, no, our, it doesn't matter what the people down the street have. It doesn't matter what the culture tells us we deserve. It matters what the Lord has laid on our heart in terms of how we want our family to go. And there's been many times throughout our marriage where I've said, you know, honey, the kids are old enough and big enough to take care of themselves. Wouldn't it be nice to have that second income and all the things that it could afford? But she stuck, stuck to her guns. And she said, no, <laughs> this is what the Lord has laid on us as a family to be. And she's helped me continue to walk that road even when I was tempted to look over here and go, oh man, <laughs> I can think a lot of hobbies I would really be able to afford some nice stuff. And she's saying, no, this is the path the Lord has laid for us and we're better for it. We're not richer for it, not in the physical sense, but spiritually we're richer for it because there is nothing that is more important than the command of Deuteronomy chapter 6, where the Lord says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then he says, Write it on the door frames of your houses. Teach your kids about it when you lay down and when you get up and when you, you're eating at the dinner table and when you're, when you're driving in the car, whenever you're, when it, whatever you're doing, you're to teach these things to your kids and press them on your children. Write them on the door frames of your houses. And that is the priority for us. Again, I, I don't know what the Lord is saying to you through this, but what he said to us is there's some sacrifices that need to be made. And those sacrifices are real. And you'll feel it. Because faithfulness to the Lord not economic priorities are the priority of a follower of Jesus. I love what Eugene Peterson says. He summarizes this passage this way. He says, Church in America, I have this against you, speaking uh, as if he were Jesus. I have this against you. You tolerate Jezebel. You tolerate, I love this, the assumption that commerce has prior claim on your talents. That commerce has prior claim on your talents. You unthinkingly take for granted that Jesus is not interested in your work. You act as if our Lord never worked as a carpenter in the business world, and he has no feelings for what you do. You make a religion out of your work, and however moral and successful it is, it is not the same religion you profess as a Christian. Convicting words. Church, this morning the Lord would say to us, keep growing. Keep growing. Keep doing what you've been doing. But don't compromise your faith for the sake of your finances. And if you've done that today, the great news is that Jesus is merciful. If you take your wrist and go like this, if you feel a thumping, that's a good thing. If you don't, that's a real problem and we probably need to do something right away. Um, but if, if you still have a pulse and you're still breathing, that means the Lord is still reaching out to you with his mercy. So many of us have compromised compromise with the culture around us when a, a boss says if you're going to work for the company I'm going to set your schedule I don't care what your religious priorities are when a boss says to you if you're going to work for this company guess what you're going to oversell the customer for the sake of the bottom line if you're going to work for this company there's all kinds of other compromises you're being called to make and you know what the Lord says if, if you've made those same compromises he gives even Jezebel the opportunity to repent to turn around to make a new priority in to you today. I want to invite you to a moment of reflection and prayer as we stand and sing this song. If you have unfinished business with the Lord today, I invite you to spend this moment in prayer with Him as we stand and sing this song. He is gracious and able and willing to forgive. Would you stand with us? Sing this song. I believe in God our Father. I believe 
Isaac's going to roll the baptistry in here in Denver. Come on up here with your family. Super cool. This young man. Are you going in fully clothed? You got it on underneath? Oh, you want to go get changed? Yeah, that would be great. So, yeah, he's going to go go ahead and get changed. We're going to do a baptism here in just a moment. Um, this baptism ready to go, and uh, go ahead and have a seat right where you are. Baptism is such an incredible, incredible moment where, um, where the Lord says, you belong to me. Um, just like we've been talking about, that that's where our ultimate loyalty lies. And this is a way, to, um, a way that God has ordained for us to say that to him, that, Lord, I want to identify fully with you. And part of the symbolism of what we're about to do here is that Denver's going to come in this water and as he's as he goes into the water, he's going to be reenacting the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And this is a God ordained moment where you go the old self goes underneath the water, is buried with Jesus just like he was buried in the earth for three days, and you're raised up out of that water to walk in a new life. And this young man has made that decision today to say, "I want my life to belong to the Lord. I want to belong to Him." And I want God to belong to me, that bright morning star. I want the Lord to be in my life. And um, so he's choosing to follow Jesus today. And I think all the conversations we've had about his love for the Lord and his excitement for this moment, um, I, I think he's, he's, he's making a great step today and moving in the right direction. So I want to open this up today, too. If you have not made this decision and you want to do this today as well, um, I know it's spur of the moment. Um, I was over there laughing because we had this moment at, at, at one of the groups the other night, and I just said, anybody else want to do this? And she was like, yep, I'm going in. I'm going in, fully clothed, and it was great. It was an awesome moment. So, yeah, so um, Denver, come on up here, and um, this is a great moment. Don't leave me hanging. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Turn around and face the people here for just a second. We'll get you in the water in just a minute. So, Denver, um, this is just kind of, this is a moment of commitment for you. You ready for this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we put some extra ice in the water. I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> if looks could kill, <laughs> actually not too bad. It's a lot better than a little of the shoots. That was the other option today, and uh, yeah. So this is. Not not warm, warm, but it's not cold, cold either. So, it's my birthday. It's your birthday? Oh. My so we have a spiritual birthday today, and 
a biological birthday, which is really cool. You'll always remember this day. And um, so, um, how old are you? Ten. Ten years ago, you came into this world, and uh, and today you get to make a commitment to follow Jesus. And the Bible says when you go into this water and you come up out of it, guess what? You're a new creation, and you're actually born again, right? You're born again. You're a new, you're a new guy. The old sins are washed away. Um, you become a new creation to follow after Jesus. Sound like a good plan? All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer with Denver, and then we'll get him in the water and uh, have a baptism this morning. Lord God, I thank you for this young man. I thank you for his family, for their investment in him. Father, I lift up this moment as a holy moment to you, a setting Denver apart for you, Lord. You've got incredible plans for this young man. He's, uh, he's a decade into this, but Lord willing, he's got a lot more decades to serve you and love you, and you've got uh, not commerce with a prior claim on his life, but you've got uh, an incredible kingdom task you've set aside for him to do, Lord. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would fill him and Lord, that you would guide and direct him in his life to always follow and serve you wholeheartedly, Lord. That that would be a, uh, this would be the day he'll always look back to and say, that was the day that I jumped in with both feet, literally. Lord, I pray that for him today. Just pray for you to forgive, cleanse, and renew, and fill him today. And all God's people said, Denver, two questions for you. They're not trick questions. Do you believe Jesus is God's son and died on the cross for you? Yes. And is he the one that you're taking today to be totally in charge of your life to follow after him? Yes. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, let's get you in the water. Not really warm. <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> All right, go ahead and have a seat there. And what you're going to do is uh, parents can come on up here and lay a hand on him, too. You're going to cross your hands like that. Just like that. <laughs> awesome. Cross your hands like that. And then grab your nose. If you grab your nose, it'll keep the water from going in there. So, all right. Denver, because you've confessed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you've chosen to follow him, we baptize you into the name of the Father the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus and raised to walk a new life. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus for I believe in the name of Jesus last time for I believe in the name of Jesus beautiful to see life. Amen. New life in Jesus found only in him. Anybody else this morning before we dismiss the service that would like to be baptized in a lukewarm horse trough today? Um, it, it really is that great. Trust me. So, um, all right. All right. Father, thank you for new life. Thank you for this congregation of incredibly beautiful people, God, that you have made. Father, as we go out these doors, give us strength. It's a tough world we're living in right now, Father, and I pray that you would give each one of us courage to live out the convictions you've placed in our lives through your Holy Spirit in the face of mighty opposition, that we wouldn't sit down to compromise with the grizzly bear of culture. We would instead walk in faithfulness and loyalty to you. Go with us now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.